This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you are listening to episode 81. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Keith Schaefer, publisher of Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin. I've met Keith a few times on the conference circuit, where we were both buddies along the way. I've also yet to do an episode completely dedicated to energy markets and how to approach looking at a potential investment in this space. I'll admit, I'm a bit of a novice in this space, so I apologize in advance if some of my questions may sound a little off, but after interviewing Keith, I felt a lot more informed. As you will hear, Keith has been running Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin for some time now, and I'm excited to share his insights on how he has gone about investing in this space. The goal for this episode is to learn more about how Keith Schaefer approaches investing in energy markets. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 81, and please enjoy my interview with Keith Schaefer from Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin. But first, a word from our sponsor. To my loyal listeners, subscribers, and fans, Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. The 2019 Investor Conference season is upon us. Where are you going this year? I'd like to take a second to invite you to join me and maybe a few of the guests you've heard on this podcast to our annual Microcap Investor Conference, the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 30th to May 2nd, 2019, at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. The Planet Microcap Showcase will be two and a half days of company presentations, networking opportunities, an educational workshop, and you will get to meet privately in one-on-one meetings with the management of well-known emerging growth private and publicly traded microcap companies. We are back with new surprises and programming that you will not want to miss. So join us for the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 30 to May 2nd, 2019 at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. For more information and register to attend, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. For this episode of the Planet Microcap Podcast, I would like to welcome Keith Schaefer, publisher of Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin. Keith, welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. Robert, thank you for having me on. It's great to have you on, and uh, we're very excited to share this interview with my audience and learn everything we can about the energy sector. But first, what is your background, and how did you get into the wide world of finance and investing? Well, my degree is actually in journalism, which is proven to be very helpful in doing the blog and the newsletter. And then, but after graduating, I really ended up in a in a PR firm, which is what happens to a lot of journalism grads and. Our business happened to be microcap mining plates. Here in Vancouver, it's the junior mining cap of the world, so it just kind of made sense that if you want to make some money, you start to get involved in that, and it just was kind of fluky that I ended up working for all these junior mining companies for quite a while and learned the business, learned how to create a good company and, and give the shareholders their best chance and all that stuff, and then uh, did that for quite a few years up till the crash in 08, and then after that, it was very clear to me, Robert, that junior mining was going to have a much tougher time. And so I moved over to oil and gas, where it's still production and reserves, but boy, when you think about, you you can drill an oil and gas well and get cash flow in three months, uh, for the mining, it's like 10 years Mm -hmm. before you make a discovery to get it into production. So it was a much, much more fun game to play, much easier game to play, and that's but that was 10 years ago, and here I am still doing it. So it's been a lot of fun, and, of course, you, you get a little wiser 
with each and every year and each and every little mistake we've had a few of those and so that's kind of how we got into the game mm-hmm. so i mean what what really drew you into it though you know i i know dollars and cents wise you're like okay i can see the opportunity is there and i'm just going to stick with it because i'm still making money but you know I, there had to be holistically something that was drawing you in as well if if i'm, I'm projecting a little bit here oh yeah absolutely so um I, I, that, there was a couple things going on then one was that the shale revolution was really just hitting the mainstream we, we it had been kind of building momentum through the 2000s and, and so you know shale and fracking started in the late 90s with George Mitchell in Texas, and but it, it took quite a while. It took a full 10 years before it really hit the mainstream. And I was lucky, Robert, that it just happened to do that right when I was starting the newsletter. So it just came so clear to me that um, retail didn't really understand what was happening. And so my newsletter is very retail-oriented, no words over nine letters. And so we just got committed to the idea of making sure that we could level the playing field for the retail guys because all the institutions were getting all this research on uh, how fracking was really reshaping the oil and energy landscape. But for retail, they weren't getting any of that information. So we made it our mission to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before I get into your your criteria, you know, for, for my audience that may not know you know, really anything. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a novice when it comes to the energy sector and, and understanding the ins and outs of, you know, oil and gas and reserves and production and what that all means. You know, what, what's that, what's the process, you know, uh, how does it work for an energy company and they're, they're in the oil and gas space and, and, and all of that. So so in in terms of what you're talking about, um, uh, how do they get, how, how does the production process work? How do they start a company and get going? Or Yeah, uh, kind of all the above, you know, like the, the idea when it comes to oil and gas, you know, is it similar to junior mining where, okay, you see prospective land and we're going to drill holes and we have to explore and, and then if they happen to find a bonanza, they go in and my, my, like, how, how does that work? Well, that, 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 that's an interesting question and, and I'll tell you why, because the, the, the shale has just re completely changed the game on how that was done. Before shale... It was almost exactly the way you described it, much like junior mining, where you had a geologist with an idea, and they would go out and stake some land, do some testing, and uh, do a little bit more testing, finally drill a well, maybe not a production well, but just uh, an exploratory well down in the ground to see what they'd get and analyze the daylights out of that. But shale has changed the game so much, uh, and, and really... You, you look at the, the microcap way of doing oil and gas, that has really kind of dried up now because it, it's just, it costs so much money to do this now. Now, the good, the good and the bad news is, the good news is that when you discover a shale field, you can almost guarantee yourself 90% drill success as you do out that field. So that, that's pretty amazing. We never used to have that. We used to have the old way of, of finding the conventional oil pools that were uh, deep down in the ground, uh, that was just like finding a mining deposit. So uh, small guys could do that. Small guys could uh, raise money from friends and family and uh, you know put together a couple million bucks and, and do a bunch of um, drilling and, and geophysical work and flip that to another company. But nowadays, the competition has got so intense, and everybody wants these uh, shale plays. And, and what makes these shale plays so exciting, Robert, is that they're, they're like big blankets. They're like huge, consistent blankets that stretch over tens of miles, and every well you drill is going to be pretty close to the same as the next one. Mm. So nowadays, what you've got to do is you've got to have an idea on a much bigger play than what you had before. It, it used to be that the small guys could, you know, get 20 acres, 50 acres, 100 acres, and and get a good well and and make good money. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, it's just the technology has improved so much, and, of course, technology costs money, Mm -hmm. that you need to have a much bigger budget. You need to be able to buy a much bigger piece of land, because certainly in the public markets, nobody cares unless you can make this a big play. Mm -hmm. So really, it, 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 it's very similar to what you described, just on a larger scale now, where geologist gets an idea, checks all the existing data, 
uh, has a certain theory on why he thinks his idea is going to be better, mm-hmm. and then they go out and raise a bunch of money and give it a whirl. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but it really is now you've got to raise thirty, fifty million bucks to get any interest from anybody uh, to play this game now. So uh, these these microcap oil companies, they still exist in some niche uh, areas. And uh, but it's it's getting tougher and tougher for the small guy to really make it work in this sector. So is so when a company says that they're they're a shale play, I mean, is it similar to a junior mining company or a mining company saying they have a district scale gold deposit? Sure. Yes. Okay. V- very similar to that. Or um, it, uh, or, or if you think of a, of a porphyry in junior mining, which is a large low grade deposit that's relatively consistent over quite a, an area. And uh, is quite consistent, though, uh, and, and makes all their money on scale as opposed to grade. Mm-hmm. Kind, of, kind of a similar idea on that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all right. So let's get into your criteria then. You know, what 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 type of criteria do you look for when you're analyzing a potential oil and gas or energy investment? Sure. So um, th- th- there's a couple answers to that. So. I, I really do try and find the smallest companies I can. So I, 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 it might not be quite micro cap, but it's close. And the idea there is you get outsized gains. If you, if you can, much like junior mining, if you can participate in the discovery of something, that's awesome. That, there's a big, big lift when, when, you, when you can do that. So what I'm looking for, first off, is preferably a management team that has built and sold a junior oil and gas company before, someone who's got a track record of success, shown that they can uh, has the, have the brains to find good assets and has the connections to raise the money to go do that. So that, that's a big part of the play. And then really after that, it becomes, okay, where, where in the world is it? Uh, you know, is it North America or not North America? Because that's a big, there's basically three areas for oil investors. There's North America, South America, and then the rest of the world. So North America is easiest to raise money, South America is the next easiest, and then the rest of the world, Asia, Africa, Australia, really tough. North American investors just don't care about those other areas, simply because there's just so much going on in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. So uh, where where it is is a big issue. The other thing that's important to me, Robert, is how many shares out does this company have? I have a bit of a saying that goes, if you've got 100 million shares out, that's strike one. If you've got 200 million shares out, that's strike two. 300 million shares out, you're out. Mm-hmm. Like, if you cannot build your company with a small number of shares out, that tells me a lot about who you are as a management person. So uh, you need to be able to uh, keep your share structure tight. You need to be able to have uh, a good chunk of stock yourself and... Uh, you need to be able to do all that you're doing in a share structure that still gives the retail shareholders a chance. Because when you have a, a young junior play that's already got one or 200 million shares out, there's just no leverage for the average retail investor. Like it's just, um, there was a small period of time when that was true, Robert, uh, when oil and gas and the shell revolution was new and sexy and these things got crazy premiums. But now oil and gas is kind of old hat and shale's kind of, been around for a while, so the hot money is no longer in our sector, and so it really means that if share, if retail shareholders, who are my audience, are going to get a fair shake, there has to be a realistic share structure. 30, 40, 50 million out, I, I love that. Mm-hmm. Just to follow up on that point, I mean, is that is that difficult to find, though? Because, you know, similar with junior mining, I'm, I know I'm going to keep coming back to that, but you know, they they have to continue to go out and raise money in order to, you know, build out their projects, right? I mean, isn't that, That's right. isn't that hard? That brings up the great next point about what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. So uh, with oil and gas, you shouldn't always have to run back to the markets because you have cash flow. Mm-hmm. Unlike junior mining or junior biotech where you have a very long time between milestones and, and cash flow, oil and gas, you can bring a well on generally in three months. So... Aside from management and share structure, the next most important thing that I'm looking for is I want to see that these companies have a play that pays out their well cost in one year or less. So if you spend $5 million on a well, I want to know that you're going to get $5 million 
worth of oil back in the first 12 months Mm -hmm. or less. So very few shale plays can do that. And so uh, you really have to be fussy. And so there's, and the smaller the company, the faster the payback has to be. Because you have to be able to recycle that money because, you know, if you're Exxon or a big company, you, you've got lots of money to drill lots of wells whenever you want. But if you're a small company, cash flow's tight. and You have to use it really, really well. And you need to have a play that pays out in one year or less. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like the math there is just pretty obvious. If you've got a, a, a play that pays out in two years, that means you're drilling one well every two years. Mm-hmm. If you've got a play that pays back in 12 months, you're drilling two wells in two years. So it's a pretty simple concept, and that's, that's the number one thing that I'm looking for. So uh, you want to find, hopefully, that they've got a big land position in a new area where the wells pay out in 12 months or less, run by a great team, and they've been able to put this together you know, with less than 70 or 80 million shares of That's kind of what the perfect company looks like. Mm-hmm. So, you know, other than you know, becoming a subscriber to Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin, you know, how can investors that might be interested in looking at the sector, you know, what, where can they go to find some of these features that you're talking about so that they can at least do their baseline due diligence on a potential new investment in the energy sector? Sure. Well, there's some, there's lots of great uh, plays out, a lot of great places that are free where you can get uh, some fantastic information. So, um, so Platts puts out a free thing every day. Um, uh, there's all kinds of different trade mags that do free publications that are really a great way to get a good background on the industry. So I subscribe to as many free things as I can get. RBN Energy, uh, Rusty Brazil does a great daily blog, like I said, Platts does. And then the other thing I tell people is uh, if they're – an investor now a lot of retail investors like to use discount brokers because they think it's cheaper I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that's true I don't use any discount brokers I use full service brokers and then I leverage that to get all their research so I get the daily morning letter energy letters from several different brokerage firms they'll send that to you free if you do your trading there so uh, that to me is a, a great way to figure things out um, so but, but in terms of finding the, um, you know, what are the economics of a, of a play and um, what, what are the track records of the management teams, that just, that, that kind of separates the men from the boys a little bit in terms of investors because you have to start making calls and build a network. And that's actually a lot of fun. I know that sounds like work, but that's actually the most fun part of the business mm-hmm. is talking to people and trading ideas and getting to know this guy and that guy and what does he like and what does he not like and, so uh, I really enjoy that. That for me, that's the most fun part of the business is, is calling up different people and seeing what they like and what they think. And of course, the other, the other thing is, um, you know, all these companies have to put out quarterly financials. So in the MDNA, uh, the Management Discussion and Analysis, or 10Q, uh, I think it is in the states, they uh, they have to give a little bit of background on these things. So it, 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 you can usually find some good information there. Not always. And, of course, the really good information is what you find on page 34 at the bottom, uh, buried (laughs) somewhere. And, of course, they all have PowerPoints, and they all have corporate PowerPoints. And what I would tell your audience is you have to be very careful on the PowerPoints of these oil and gas companies. I don't want to say that they all lie, but I would say that every bit of information you see on that PowerPoint, you need to be very careful about because these guys are obviously going to put their best foot forward Mm -hmm. and a lot of the numbers they put out aren't quite legitimate in the sense that they they might say oh well we've got an internal rate of return of like 80 percent or 100 percent and when you talk to these management teams directly and you question them on things like that they kind of go oh well you know we didn't include I, i say well that, that your numbers don't make sense to me because of this and that, and they'll tell me, oh, well, you know, we had four wells over here that were a lot lower, and they weren't really representative, and this one area over here that we've got with, that we are going to drill at some point, but not right now, we didn't include those wells. It's like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, 
you, you really have to just take everything you see on these PowerPoints with a grain of salt. But I think it's still a good place to start and gives you an idea on um, on, on what's uh, on, on the kind of bare bones of the play. And the, the other place that I go to um, is Seeking Alpha. There's usually quite a few, um, any, in any company you've, you're going to look at, somebody has probably written about it, mm -hmm. if it's of any size at all, on, um, on Seeking Alpha. And again, you just have to understand those guys are all amateurs. Mm -hmm. They're not professionals. They're all bullish. They're all long the stocks that they're writing about, even mm -hmm. though they say they're not. And, um, but it just, again, it's just a good resource to help you figure out, you know, a, a lot of times what happens there is, uh, the transcripts from the, uh, quarterlies get posted to Seeking Alpha. That's fantastic. That's what I, I should have led with that. That, that's one of the best places to go. So if you don't have time to get on these quarterly conference calls, Seeking Alpha publishes the transcripts from a lot of calls. And that's a great place because you get to hear what questions the analysts are asking. Mm -hmm. And so that'll help you as a retail investor really get up to speed on a company in the sector. Mm -hmm. So Sorry, that was a long answer, Robert. No, no, th that was that was great. I'm, I actually, you provide a lot of really good actionable information there. So, you know, let's say, all right, so Keith, let's say after, you know, you did all, all of this work, right? You see a company, it fits some of your criteria. You did all this due diligence. You read the transcripts. You really dug deep, you know. How do you then judge or, or how do you value that company? You know, you know, some, you know, in, in non resource and non uh, uh, basic materials, you know, uh, in traditional consumer goods, you know, some people have different ways in which to, uh, to to value the companies to see if it's something that's investable, you know, so for you, you know, what what's that? What's that measure look like where you say, OK, this is something that is exactly right up my alley? So a couple answers to that. So um, the, the, the bigger the company, the more you just focus on cash flow, just mm -hmm. like any other business. Mm -hmm. But what's the cash flow multiple this thing's trading at? Um, and so, but even within that, um, I, I would tell you that I like expensive stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes investors make is saying, oh, well, this company's trading at nine times cash flow, but here's this company's trading at six times cash flow. I'm going to buy this one. To me, that, that that's a big mistake. The market price is in everything. So when, when I, I like expensive stocks because uh, management teams can use their stock as currency to buy weaker companies. And so um, uh, even on plays that are quite similar, if, if there's a different management team in place and, and that one particular management team has a better reputation or a better track record, the street's going to value that stock higher. Um, so Multiples of cash flow uh, is, is the first thing I'm, I'm going to have a good look at. And then I, what I do is, is I'll kind of handicap that and say, okay, well, uh, what's their decline rate? So every oil well declines in production every year. When a, let's just use a, a very simple example. So let's say a boomer well comes on at 1,000 barrels a day uh, for the first few months, and then over the first year, it'll come down so much that uh, maybe it'll only average 400 barrels a day over the first year. Uh, and then that decline just keeps going every year, usually for about three years, on, on, particularly on the shale wells I'm talking now. The first three years, you get uh, you know probably 80% of the oil out of the well in those first three years, and uh, production drops off 80%, maybe even more. And so then what happens after that, Robert, is what we call the long tail. So that well might produce for another 10 to 20, even 20 years, and, uh, but only at like 10 barrels a day. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's still profitable because it's, it's all free money, but it's, um, it, you, what you want to find out here is, is just what kind of decline rate those first three years have because, you know, they've got to spend a bunch of money to replace that production and then you know, spend even more money to, to grow production. So mm -hmm. finding out what, what the decline rate is on the wells is pretty important. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then um, what would be the one, some of the other things that, that we look at? Um, well, like we talked about payback before, mm -hmm. and so that's important, and along with the decline rate. Uh, and then um, 
depend, uh, and I'd say those would be the two big things. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the one thing that I would point your, to your audience to be careful of is a lot of the companies like to use this term called net back. So the net back is basically the profit per barrel of oil that they get. And uh, to me, that's one of the single most misleading statistics in the oil and gas business. And as anybody in your audience gets into oil and gas and starts to check it out, they're going to come across this term a lot. And these companies are going to say, hey, we have a really high net back. We have like our costs, oil's $57 a day. Our costs are uh, 20 bucks. Our net back is $37. And that's like the highest in, in, in the state, the country, the play, whatever. And I would tell you that all my history says that net back is a bad number to look at. Yeah. And it, it's kind of hard to explain why, but uh, basically net back is when, whenever a company, but I've, what I've learned is that when a company starts to crow about their high net back, that means they're hiding something. Mm. Because really it's, it's about payback. It's not about net back. So what I've found is that really high net back wells actually also have fairly high costs and so they don't pay out near as fast. So I actually have a big red flag come up for me whenever anybody starts, certainly if they start off and lead in their presentation with the fact that, oh, we have very profitable barrels, our net back is really high. I would tell your audience, if, there's, if you're going to watch out for one thing where these management teams are going to try and bamboozle you, that's the term to watch out for. And, and uh, when, in, when anybody starts talking to you about net backs, profit per barrel. Say, I want to hear about the payback. I want to hear how fast that well pays out. Tell me, tell me about that. How many months? Mm-hmm. And um, the Canadian teams actually talk about that quite a bit. The U.S. teams really don't. It's really difficult to get the payback number in months out of a U.S. management team, which really annoys me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that should be pretty simple numbers. And they'll, they might say that it's... Um, a, 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 a trade secret, they wouldn't tell that to anybody. It's like, well, that's just garbage. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've all but hung up the phones on more than one management team when they said, oh, we can't tell you that. Mm-hmm. I can't get into any kind of field-level economics mm-hmm. uh, on my play with you. That's, that, that's crazy. Why would I do that? It's like, okay, no worries, my friend. God bless you. Have a great life. Mm-hmm. Hope you and your stock do well, but you'll be doing it without me. Well, is there, I mean, I have to follow up on this. You may, I mean, is there is there a balance that they have to play there? Because, you know, as an investor, on one hand, you want to see great payback, right? You want to see it, um, you really, you want to see, you know, your, your, what you're investing in payback faster than normal. But at the same time, does the company have to be careful as to, you know, how, you know, how much they want to, or how soon they say they can do the pay. Like there must be some reason why they don't want to say in order to maybe keep you on as a shareholder. I, I don't know. I mean, like what, what would, what would entice a management team to not tell you? Well, there'd be two things. One of this, if it's really early in the play, I completely get that. They might say, look, we don't even have 10 wells yet. Or, or cause most teams, they want to be conservative. They, they, they don't want to raise expectations too much right. unless they have to raise money. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, they, they, they're playing the long game. They, they want their credibility intact. So if it's, if it's early on in a play and they don't have a good representative sample of wells in their play, I totally get how they would not want to say that uh, for their own credibility. But other than that, once you've got 15, 20 wells in a play, and you're not willing to give me the, the, the straight goods, the, the, there is absolutely no reason for that. The, mm-hmm. In their own mind, they might have a reason, but it's, they're, they're wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, many, many other management teams do that. And so if, uh, if you're not willing to do it, then your transparency is really poor, and I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. So this actually leads into another question I have. And, you know, especially when it comes to energy markets and oil and gas specifically, everyone always asks, you know, what will the oil price be? You know, and uh, and there's a similar issue, I guess, when it also comes to other commodities markets. You know, so how do oil and gas companies navigate these external pressures on their businesses? And, and then as an investor, what should you look out for? Well, obviously, the big external pressure is their price, right? So, um you know, the, what, 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 and nobody has any control over the oil price. So um, I, I, 
what I think they really have to be careful of is they have to manage their debt levels. Because when oil prices are high, and if you've got lots of debt, and all of a sudden oil prices get low, you're in trouble. So, uh, you know, your, your debt to cash flow might be, this industry uses a lot of debt. It's a very capital intensive industry. Uh, usually you, and, and the amount of debt that, that investment team, that management teams are comfortable with has been changing. It's been coming down. There's a huge difference between Canada and the States. The state, the States really doesn't get too nervous till you're over four times debt to cash flow in Canada. You, you would never get that. You, you, you wouldn't even get it. As soon as you go over two times debt to cash flow, your valuation starts to go through the floor. You, you just get punished so hard. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's got even worse lately because of the volatility in oil prices, the, the Canadian market is demanding really these teams be at one to one and a half times debt to cash flow. So you you, you really have to manage your debt levels through the cycle of oil prices. That that's the number one thing. And so particularly as a, you're a microcap player, let's talk about the microcap sector. Mm-hmm. They have to avoid debt at all costs. Like there's just no way you can put debt on as a small company. You have to issue equity. Now, uh, Canadians do that all the time. Americans do like to use debt. They're, they're a lot more cowboy that way. And so it, it's actually quite a different culture in the oil patch uh, on either side of the border. But um, so, and again, that often comes down to, you know, what's, what's your payback on these wells? You, you, you do need to have some debt to, to get through things. But you, usually you're only going to use debt, certainly not for exploration, because you might miss, but you're only going to use, excuse me, I'm sorry, Robert, for development. So once you've got mad a discovery and you know your, your next few wells are going to be great, yes, then you can go use debt. But even then you kind of have to be careful about managing it. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the other thing they do is they hedge. Mm-hmm. So they sell forward their production at a certain price, and that, that's a bit of a crapshoot. Most teams will tell you they hate hedging because mm-hmm. shareholders, unless they get it absolutely perfect, vilify them for it because uh, the shareholders think that these management teams should be perfect. Mm-hmm. So... Um, those would be the big external pressures. Uh, one, serv- one pressure that really has kind of disappeared is service costs. Mm-hmm. So there used to be a very vibrant oil services industry, and, and you, you have multi-billion dollar global companies like Schlumberger and Halliburton and Weatherford that uh, would do drilling and fracking and all the other myriad of services that the oil and gas sector needs to, to do their jobs. But since the Saudis pulled the rug out from under everybody in late 2014 and let the oil price collapse from 90 to $26 a barrel. In the last four years, we have really seen no service cost inflation at all. The service sector has borne all of the pressure of this low oil price. So basically, uh, they haven't been able to increase prices at all. Even in 2017, when oil was doing really, really well, they... The market was so nervous about what would happen that the oil producers got all the benefit of a rising oil price and the service companies got nothing. And to this day, there there is really no, you're you're paying the same price or even less than you were in 2014 for almost any service that you can think of. So uh, that's one cost pressure that the producers haven't had to deal with. But boy, the poor service companies, man, they've just had a tough, tough time. It's... those guys have really been taken out to the shed. Mm-hmm. It's, it's been uh, very tough for them. Mm-hmm. So uh, another question I have, and this is something that is uh, also has to do with, uh, or, well, it's actually really inspired by uh, something that uh, I, I've interviewed Brent Cook many times, uh, both on here and, and on video. And, you know, he's said a couple times about how, you know, it's more difficult to find, you know, a new high grade deposit, you know, they're, they're fewer and far between, you know, so I'm just curious if there's similar pressures in the oil and gas industry as well. You know, I mean, is it harder to find these, you know, bonanza shale plays? I mean, you know, do you have to go to more, you know, uh, uh, far reaching places that are farther and farther away from, you know, let's say your North American home base? Uh, yes. So for the most part, yes. Uh, so what, you, what we're finding here is that there's, that there's still the odd shale play being found in the United States. So, you know, you had your big five get done very quickly, the Bach and the Permian, uh, the Eagleford, the Niobrara, and the Marcellus. And so, uh, and then there's been 
a few junior plays along the way that have come up uh, around the Gulf Coast, and the, the latest one is in um, Wyoming. So, but, but, but these are smaller plays that don't have quite the same scale, but technology is improving so much, Robert. Like, mm-hmm. every year we all say, okay, well, this is, this is the last year where we're going to see any huge improvements, like 20 30%. We're, we're only going to start to see incremental improvements now of, like, 3% or 5% a year, and you know, we've kind of figured it all out. But no, it's just unbelievable what every year for the last three or four years we have been able to, technology has allowed us to source new oil uh, and find cheaper and cheaper ways of getting it out of the ground. So uh, our uh, these wells are going deeper, the horizontal legs are going longer and longer and longer, like it used to be that we would do, we started off doing half mile, uh, quarter mile horizontals. Now we're regularly doing two, two and a half mile horizontals. And the technology and the horsepower, the force that you need to apply to get the drill down doing that is huge, which is again why I say it's been very difficult for the microcap player to stay alive in this sector. It's become so high cost and, and the technology is improving so much. It's just amazing. So um, that's why we're, we're really just not going much farther afield just yet. So, um, and the, the other big thing is is that you know the politics around oil and gas are, are quite difficult, much like mining. So to, to do what we're doing in the United States and Canada, you need a vibrant services sector, and most nowhere else in the world is there a services sector like there is here in. North America, where you have many different drillers, many different frackers, uh, many different water handlers, uh, and, and again, there's so many different niche things that um, have their own industry for. Um, that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, absolutely nowhere. Uh, it doesn't exist in South America, it doesn't exist anywhere in Africa, it doesn't exist in, in Europe. In, in North America, you need a part for something, just like your car, right? you know, a couple days uh, at the most, if not same day. Uh, anywhere else in the world, everywhere else in the world, it's weeks. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a real hesitancy to get farther afield for these shale plays. And let's look at Argentina as a perfect example, where uh, they have one of the best plays in the world called the Vaca Muerta, which is Spanish for dead cow. It's on the Argentine-Chilean border. And uh, that play has been known about for 10 years. It gets great results, and it has just been slow as molasses to develop because of the politics of Argentina. Uh, you know, just it, it, it's, it's in a high, remote area, and uh, you just can't afford to go in there paying drill crews. And if something goes down, you've got to pay a standby rate for your drill crew for, you know, 15, 20 guys for a week and a half to get a part. Yeah, that that doesn't wash. So that that's why it's been very difficult to see the shale revolution get exported around the world, mm-hmm. and it's why you're never going to see the shale ex the shale get exported into places like Russia or the Middle East or any of these places because there's just you're, no one's willing to go into these areas and, and spend a lot of money in the, and to, to develop the services sector. That the politics and the economics everywhere else in the world is still just too tough. So then my, my next question is to also follow up on that, especially in North America, because I feel like another pressure is, you know, look, I'm in California. There's always environmental issues when it comes to any sort of drilling for natural resources. So how do environmental pressures affect the oil and gas industry and how ha- how will it affect it moving forward, in your opinion? Well, cer- certainly there's a big difference between Canada and the United States. Um, Canada, because of the... Uh, huge campaign to stop the oil sands and shut that down, Canada's had much bigger impact. You, you, you've, we've elected uh, provincial governments in Alberta and British Columbia that are anti-oil. We've elected a federal government that's anti-oil. So you, you're, you're seeing pipelines get uh, stopped. You're, you're seeing um, new environmental rules. Um, and, and to a certain degree, some of these things are, are actually valid, uh, and some of them are just a little crazy. So um, it, in the states, you've, you've got like in Colorado where they've uh, got um, groups saying, hey, we don't want to have oil and gas being drilled uh, at a certain distance from our 
our homes, and of course that's as you've seen this urbanization of America. You, you know, you, you've got all kinds of areas now that um, didn't used to be populated that have been oil and gas for years, and, and population centers have moved in. But, uh, so in Canada, it, it's a getting your what they call the social license has been uh, really difficult. Uh, if you're in Alberta, it, it, it's not too bad if you're a small operator, but anywhere else. Uh, it, it's been really difficult. Quebec has basically outlawed all oil and gas development. They don't even want pipelines going through their province. They're they're a bit off. And uh, and internationally, it, it's it's also very difficult. And um, the industry has shot themselves in the foot a few times. You know, they've they really haven't kind of kept up on the changing social sphere in energy. And, and certainly internationally, one of the problems, of course, is that. You spend a lot of money in these third world countries uh, drilling your wells and getting everything going, and you hire as much local talent as possible, which is usually all the unskilled labor around the area. Um, though I think that's getting better. But then the, the problem that oil has to deal with, I, I think, is actually a bit of an economic problem because oil actually has a fairly low footprint. You know, when you go on a property tour to a mine, you get to see this great big operation, maybe it's an open pit. But when you go to see a, uh, an oil and gas property anywhere else in the world, you, you see a pipe coming out of the ground. It, it's quite the honor. And it's uh, it, it, even though it's got a very low footprint, the problem that I kind of see it, that it really isn't talked about that much, Robert, is oil's incredibly profitable. Once you've drilled that well, you don't need anybody anymore. So all of a sudden, the company is getting huge money out of uh, the ground, and, of course, they pay royalties to the governments, but for the local communities, there's almost no benefit, mm. no ongoing benefit. So ener the energy industry has to figure that out, because particularly internationally, where you've got so much corruption, uh, and, of course, we have a lot of corruption here, too, which just has a lot more finesse to it, <laughs> um, you know, you, they need to figure out a, a bit of a different model that will... Um, allow local communities to benefit more from energy production than what they have in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, would you also, you know, that's an interesting point that I actually hadn't even realized before. Um, but do you also think that some of these regulation on oil and gas when an energy alternatives that it's not that that hasn't been fully flushed out yet or there it hasn't been fully introduced? I mean, is there like a, is there still a gap in where you know, obviously, you know, like using the Canadian government governments, for instance, they're they're trying to be to to uh, regulate oil and gas a little bit more. And yet some of the alternatives aren't ready, readily available yet. You know, so what's what what's happening there? I mean, am I am I misinformed in that question? When you say alternatives, you mean like the alternative energy sources? Yeah. Like solar, renewables, all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, is that readily available that's making up for the regulation that they're putting on oil and gas? Not, not, not in Canada, it's not. Uh, in, in, the, in the States, you're seeing so much, almost, 50, I should say, well over 50% of all new power generation in the States is renewables. So mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when I say fantastic, uh, I, I should qualify that in that we really don't know what the long-term economics of renewable power is yet. Right, energy storage uh, really isn't economic yet, and uh, the subsidies that we've put into green power have just been mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in terms of true alternatives to oil and gas, you know, unless you want to go nuclear, and of course, which we can do whenever we want because we've got the technology and there's more uranium in the world than we ever thought possible. But uh, Generally speaking, no. There, 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 there's nothing else in the um, in the uh, pipeline, par pardon the pun, that would be able to replace oil and gas. Not not even close. Um, gas has replaced coal. Uh, so from an ec from both an economic and a environmental point of view, that's very positive. But no, you know, you know, and that brings up an interesting point because really, what these governments should be doing is trying to uh, you know incentivize Technology, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship in these other industries, as opposed to trying to crap all over the oil and gas industry. It's much uh, more empowering to be for something than against something. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I, I, I would say that no, there's there, there, there's no real clear plan. All all they've tried to do is is just tax the oil and gas industry out of existence, as opposed to coming up with any other uh, realistic plan that would allow people to you know have cheaper, better power. Mm-hmm. All right. So listen, Keith. I know I could go. We could go on for probably another three hours talking about the sector itself. But you know, getting getting back to the task at hand here. You know, in terms of. Uh, you know how investors should analyze a potential investment, and and really looking at uh, the sector itself and where they can potentially go and, and make money. Hopefully, you know I, I want to ask again about you know the importance of the role of uh, management to your investing thesis. You know what are some of the key things that you look for when you're speaking with management and you're seeing how they're uh, they're running their businesses. Well, here's where mining oil and gas on the junior side are very, very similar. So you have serial entrepreneurs on the mining side, guys who have found deposits and been able to sell them, you know, build them up and sell them. And, and oil and gas is the same way. You're, you're looking for somebody, because uh, there was a lot of buyouts done. There, there, it was a very uh, straightforward business model back in the day of, uh, and when I say back in the day, I mean right up until probably three, four years ago, where you would make a discovery and uh, anywhere in Canada or the United States, and you would uh, maybe have a few thousand acres, and you would um, drill a well or two, and, and then you'd be able to shop that around to anybody larger than you, an intermediate or a larger producer, and say, okay, look, here's what I've got. Here's how big the land position is. If we do extrapolate, the math is pretty simple. And uh, so these guys would only have to drill a few wells, maybe only spend 10, 20 million bucks, get to 1,000 barrels a day, and they'd be able to sell it because somebody else would say, oh, yeah, I, I can keep this asset and grow this asset for years. Um, so you want to find a team that has done that a few times. You want to find a management team that has been able to achieve that goal multiple times and reward shareholders. So really their, their background is, is so important because uh, m- much like in mining, when these guys go to start a new venture, they get an incredibly good cost of capital. That They get a huge premium in their stock out of the gate for who they are. And uh, that just allows them to raise a lot more money and a lot better prices to go get the best assets again. So it's just so key to have these guys um, at the helm. So management is really, really key. And then the other thing you you look for is you want to talk to these guys and just see how you you want a, a group who's like obsessive about costs. Mm-hmm. Like that can constantly reduce their cost per barrel on their play, and are they those? Are are they that kind of guy? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is uh, I'm now getting to my my favorite question, and you know, uh, what what would you say? Can you give us an investing experience that has shaped your current investing thesis? Oh God, I went broke on my first trade. <laughs> So I, I was in when I was a, a, a just got in the business. Uh, there was a guy in my office who had a junior mining company, and he just reeled me in. I was I was just a big trout. I rose to the bait, swallowed hook, line, and sinker. And uh, that company was one of the worst. So typical of the junior mining scams that come out of Vancouver once in a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you know, I, I bought that stock at twenty five cents, but everything I owned into it as a twenty four year old. And uh, it was uh, basically a rollback within seven months. Mm. So um, I was just very determined, Robert, that after that situation, I was never going to be taken advantage of again. And so I got religion. I, I, got, uh, I, I learned everything about the business, every possible way that I could get screwed by investing in uh, public companies, I, I figured it out. I figured out how to talk to people. I figured out what questions to ask. I figured out what to look for in the um, in uh, in structure, in management. Uh, and then th- this guy broke all the rules. He was he had no technical ability. He was just a really good talker. And uh, so that honestly was the best thing that ever happened to me. It really was. Uh, you know, it caused me so much grief with. The woman I was living with at the time, my own family, because I was just so real excited about that I was going to, you know, on my way to riches and uh, blah, blah, blah. 
<laughs> so that that was. Um, Keith, that's it. Don't worry. That's a very common answer whenever I ask that question. <laughs> so, um, so then, so then, Keith, what 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 advice do you have then for new microcap investors that are interested in the energy sector? Oh, what, what I tell people is create a paper portfolio and trade it for a year. Don't ever put any real money in the sector for a year. You can go to all these websites like Yahoo Finance, and you can create your own fake portfolio and just pretend that it's real. Mm-hmm. And so then you get an idea on a stock, and so you uh, you go put it in your fake, fake portfolio and see how you do. Mm-hmm. All right. that's, some, that's good advice right there. I think that's actually how I got my start. Um, so then, Keith, where, where can my audience go and find more information about you and uh, the Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin? Uh, the, the website really is the best place, uh, www.oilandgas-investments.com. And, um, it's, um, we run a blog where we try and publish free stories every week. It doesn't always happen because I spend so much time on research looking for new stocks. That's, that's the priority. Whenever I get a new idea, everything else in my business stops and I go research that idea to the ends of the earth, talk to management, blah, blah, blah. But, when I've got time, I try and put up at least one story a week on uh, on the blog, and that'll help give you an idea. And, and, and all our stories are really investor-focused. We don't talk much about macro oil and gas and all that stuff. Uh, we're, we're all about making money. So for investors, it's a very investor-oriented site. Well, Keith, uh, thank you so much again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast, and uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you again soon. Robert, God bless you. Chat soon. Chat soon. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and thank you, Keith, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast, go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast, or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast, where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of StockNewsNow.com, the official microcap news source, and the Microcap Review Magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great week, everyone.